some of these passages Paul is he says for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof they've got a misconception of the earth's ownership it belongs to Satan then in Deuteronomy 10 and verse 14 this kind of sums it all up behold the heaven and the heaven of heavens is the Lord's thy God the earth also with all that therein is it pretty much sounds like just about everything to me if Amen. not everything Amen. the heaven the heavens of heavens the earth and all that therein is sounds like everything oh, yeah. is mine the whole universe belongs to me according to them satan owns this earth if not the universe he missed the universe but he did gain the world he could have gotten the universe if some of those other covenants would have failed. Adam failed in his period of probation. That's how he got the earth. And now he's after Saturn and Mars and Jupiter and all the rest of them. He wants to gain everything. And they almost think that there's a, even a possibility that he ever could gain everything. There's not even a remote possibility that could ever happen. But they see Isaiah 14, Satan said, I will ascend and I'll be like the Most High. And they almost think that he really could have done that, that he could have ascended and could have been like, I can guarantee you they, they feel that because it comes across in all of the spirit, and it's the wrong spirit, of their teachings. And they have a misconception about all of these things. Anything that comes to God and Satan, it's a total misconception. Uh, guess what? They're the same people who really don't believe in casting out demons. Now... You know, you don't believe that God owns anything. You tell us the devil owns everything and he owns everything here on the earth, but you tell us that we, people don't need to go through occult deliverance because, after all, it was in innocency that you dabble in the occult and the devil, he's really not going to move in on you there. We well, see, according to your theory, he owns everything here. So you ought to doubly believe in occult deliverance and the casting out of demons since they'd be just running rampant everywhere. But they don't even believe in that. When you teach too strong about deliverance, they don't, none of them have deliverance ministries or deliverance teachings. They've got a few teaching on casting out demons because they tell us, well, Jesus and Paul did it. They know that it has to be done today. But they don't have near the emphasis that we have or that the Word of God has upon the whole subject of demons, deliverance, and Satan. And they should if he owns everything, which according to them he does. Uh, then over in Jeremiah 18, uh, this moves on to another point in the whole theory. Two major points that we're really covering. Who owns what? And does God really have to have man's permission? No, God doesn't legally have to have man's consent or his agreement or his body or anything else they've got a whole elaborate theory constructed around the subject of the physical body in telling us that God has to have man's approval man's check of opinion upon it and then God will be free to move he'll have access in the earth Jeremiah 18 the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah and in a familiar account of scripture and of daily life of that day he goes on to tell us something about the potter and the clay arise and go down to the potter's house and there i will cause thee to hear my words then i went down to the potter's house and behold he wrought a work on the wheels the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter so he made it again another vessel as it seemed good to the potter to make it then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord. Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. God says, Israel, don't you think I can do to you just like the potter does to the clay? He doesn't ask the clay's opinion. Now, what type of vessel would you like to be? After all, I don't have any authority over you. Have you ever heard a piece of clay talking back to the potter and saying, now, this is what I want to be. This is what I want to do and have. No. Well, the analogy fits. Man can't tell his creator 
what he wants to do or what he wants to be? Can the clay and the vessel really reply to the potter? Well, go over to Romans. Paul picks up the same subject over here in Romans chapter 9, verse 15. Well, a little earlier here in verse 15, God said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it's not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Well, here's an answer on why we had ten plagues and not one. And I said it earlier, God gets more glory out of the whole thing by demonstrating his power time and time again and by showing at the same time how wicked and base man is after all. He's not so good after all. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy and whom he will he hardeneth. Thou wilt say then unto me, Well, then why doth he yet find fault? For who has ever resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing form say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay? He's asking the question, Hath not the potter power over the clay? And this is in direct contradiction to their teaching, no. The potter does not have power over the clay. The clay has to agree with the potter. You've got to have the clay's authority, but the potter's ability. The potter has the ability to make a vessel, but you've got to have the clay before he can make something out of it. Well, that sounds all fine and good. They'll, they'll say, well, all these passages, that, that doesn't disprove anything because over there in Jeremiah, the passage we read, here in Romans uh, chapter 9, we've still got to have something to work with before God can get anything done. And so they say, well, see, you still have to have clay. But how did the, the world get here in the first place? He, he just made it. And there wasn't anyone's opinion to ask at that time. And so he's saying, why can't he do the same thing again? It's not that the potter is going to make a piece of clay vanish and then appear magically or something. There's no need in that. He's already got the clay. But we're not talking about whether you've got the clay. We're talking about the consent and the willingness of that lump of clay to become whatever God wants it to become. And the clay is totally under the power and in the hands of the potter. Just because clay is available doesn't mean anything. There are a lot of people out there in the world available. A lot of them even say they want to serve God. Even consenting, Lord, use me. God never uses them. He only uses those whom he chooses to use. Because many people are saying, here am I, send me. And he's not sending them anywhere. They're sending themselves. But he's not sending them anywhere. So that's no argument to say, well, we've got clay here. And, and, and that's like man. God has to have man before he can do beautiful things and wonderful things in the earth because remember there was a time when things didn't exist and he had to make them psalm 135 psalm 135 and verse 6 whatsoever the lord pleased that did he in heaven and in earth in the seas and all deep places Amen. whatsoever the Lord please not what man would allow him to do Romans back to Romans chapter 11 verses 33 through 36 oh the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out for who hath known the mind of the Lord or who hath been his counselor Amen. Or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again. Now this is a clinching verse. Who hath first given to him, and therefore God owes you something in return. Who hath first given? You see, in everything, the choice is always God's first, first and then he chooses those and gives 
the very ones he chooses the ability to respond to his election and his selection. They don't even have the ability. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, the whole passage. They don't even have the ability to respond under God, unto God's selection until he gives them that ability. Who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again. For of him, and through him, and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. Not man, from man, or to man, or through man. And they tell us, after all, that God has to have a willing vessel. Many times he finds vessels that aren't willing. What about old Balaam? Balaam says, I'm trying my best to prophesy evil against Israel. I'm trying to curse them. And he said, but God's given me a commandment to bless, and he has blessed, and I cannot reverse it. And he tried to reverse it. That's why he goes several times and tells uh, the king of Zippor there now, go to another place, offer sacrifices there, and I'll curse Israel for you there. And he said, I opened my mouth and tried to curse. He said, but nothing but a blessing came out. God doesn't need a willing vessel. <laughs> what about old Caiaphas over there in the end, I think, of John 11? Caiaphas, the high priest in Jesus' day, and Caiaphas rebukes his colleagues and says, ye know nothing. He said, don't you know it's expedient that one die for the whole nation rather than the whole nation perish in their sins? He's prophesying of Christ's death. He's the one that put him on the cross. And he's prophesying of what he's going to do, and he doesn't even know what he's saying. Willing vessel? Caiaphas didn't even know what he was saying. If he knew what he was saying at that time, he never would have put Jesus on the cross. Because that was the very claim Jesus was making, that I've come into the world as a ransom for many. So that the whole world won't die, I'll die in your stead. And Caiaphas is prophesying that. Willing vessel? God numbers can use an ass if he has to. And he does. And he can use false charismatic teachers if he wants to. I think we have a tape on that, God's use of false ministries. Because as we show on that tape, God uses them for a variety of reasons. Some people get saved through false ministries because they hear the word of God not because they believed all the deception, then a lot of people are going to be damned because God sent them truth and they love not the truth and so they've got a lie from the mouth of many charismatic teachers. And he's going to use that as a form of judgment against them. So this whole business about God needing anyone doesn't hold any water. Then over in Daniel chapter 4 and verse 34, Daniel 4.34, And at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me. I wish charismatics would have the return of some understanding. Amen. And I blessed the Most High, not the Most Low, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. And all those bodies down there on the earth are reputed as nothing. He said all those bodies, they're reputed as nothing. God doesn't need bodies down here, you old heretical charismatic believers and teachers that are teaching this and believing this out there. The inhabitants of the earth are nothing in his sight. He doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among those bodies down there. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? Verse 37, Those that walk in pride, he is able to abase. He is going to be abasing many non-charismatic charismatics because they're walking in this humanistic pride that we are the inhabitants of the earth, the body of Christ. And he just says, here, those inhabitants are nothing in my sight. He tells us over there in Isaiah 40, the nations are a drop in the bucket, a drop in the bucket, all the great nations of the earth. Does God need great nations to work through? He says they're all a drop in the bucket. And you know that's Isaiah 40. And you know a drop of water won't go very far when you're thirsty or you're trying to create living waters or something streams of living waters in the deserts well you pour out one drop he said that's all the nations are just a drop 
He said, I'm going to have to do all this by my own power, by my own spirit. Because there's none down there willing. He said, there's none down there willing. Read Romans 3. There's none that doeth good. No, not one. He's quoting Psalm 14. There's none that doeth good. No, not one. And they're telling us there are a lot of good men out there. And worse than that, there are a lot of good women out there. And I've read what the preacher said. Ecclesiastes 7. Oh, among a thousand women, I've not found one good one. I had someone call me. I found out from someone else the other day, a woman hater. Why does he hate women like he does? And I always tell those people, I married one, didn't I? <laughs> Why does he, someone said that about me. Why does he hate women like he does? I don't hate women. Just I believe what the word of God said. Amen. Proverbs 31, give not your strength unto them that destroy kings. And you know who destroys kings, not men, but women. And Ecclesiastes 7 makes it stronger than that. Oh, there are a few good women, but not many. And they're only good because God has made them that way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> a woman hater, we've got women in the church. We don't say, well, we're going to seat the men over here and the women over there. Or let's just exclude all the women. After all, this is we're a male-dominated church here. We are a male-dominated church here. But let's just put all the women out. Why is he, I'm not a woman hater. Uh, I come pretty close to it when it comes to charismatic, so. <laughs> Females or males. That are teaching all of this nonsense that, that so many thousands of people listen to. It's not fair they have such a big audience out there. But that's the way the Bible says it'll be. But it's not fair they have such a big audience out there. Just the thousands. Listen, well, Second Peter 2, verse 2 says, Many will follow their pernicious ways, Amen. and only few will find their way into the kingdom. Amen. So as we always say, we know we're on the right path because few follow what we're saying. Right. They don't believe that. They're telling us how many millions are being saved now. And God's going to sweep the earth, and I guess everyone's going to be saved. It sounds real close to ultimate reconciliation to me that pretty much everyone's going to get saved out right. there. Because they want us to start praying and interceding for the government officials. We'll be teaching on that before too long, that all of them get saved and someone goes witness to all these communist leaders and gets, get them all saved over there. That's not God's plan or not God's will or not God's purpose. Well, you say, where in the world? You see, we haven't found a verse yet, now have we, for a basis of this theory. We haven't found a verse. Now, they, they tell us what they think Satan was thinking, about gaining the universe and tying God's hand and slipping in the back door in Genesis. But we don't find any of that there. We don't find it says that God lost his man and he was trying to get his man back and he couldn't gain entrance into the world without his man. We don't find, we haven't found a verse that said that yet. So they've got to have one that says it. And they do, Gen or not Genesis, uh, John chapter 10. I believe verses 1 all the way down through verse 14. <clears throat> now we'll have to do a little interpretation here of, of what's going on here in chapter 10. You know, it's this first half of the chapter of John 10 is the famous section on the shepherd and the sheep, the doorway into the sheepfold. And you might already know what some of the things mean. Uh, it's not a parable, uh, like verse 6 says. Uh, the Greek word for parable is a different word entirely. This is more like an allegorical figure of speech that's being used here. Only time this word, this Greek word, is found in non-Johannine literature is in Petrine writings, and there the word is a, really means a proverb because it has reference to a short saying. It's also used, I believe, further in John, I think over in chapter 16. But anyway, here... Uh, in chapter 10, first five verses, uh, they found what they call a basis. It's, there's a whole chapter in the book on John 10, uh, their basis for illegal entrance and operation. Verily, ver and see if you don't already know, maybe you don't know everything, but see if you don't already know what some of these figures of speech are. In other words, what do they represent? Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth 
And remember that an allegorical figure of speech is like a parable in that not every single detail necessarily has some interpretation to put along with it. He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. He that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. <clears throat> to him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. Okay. Let's go back to verse 1 and start interpreting it. He that entereth not by the door, you've got to find an interpretation for that or a match for that, into the sheepfold, you've got to find a match for that, but climbeth up some other way, we have to find a match for that, the same is a thief and a robber. And then this will tell us who the person is that he's talking about. So you've got four things here. Now, what's the door? Now, if you don't know, don't say. I mean, if you know John 10, the answer is given word for word in John 10. Now, they have seen that, and then they tell us that it's talking about something else. What's the door? The human body, according to them. The human body. What's the sheepfold? The world. He that entereth not by a human body into the world but climbeth up some other way. What would that be? Well, God illegally interfering with the affairs of humanity. The same is a thief and a robber. Whoever does that is a thief and a robber. Now, did you ever get that when you read John 10? Charismatic revelation. <laughs> yeah, write that in your notes there. Write it in the margin, charismatic revelation. The door is the human body. The sheepfold is the world. The other way is the legal entrance and operation, and the thief and the robber is whoever does this. And, of course, they would say that this would be God, if he ever does this, works outside a human body. He that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. And then Jesus says, or then it's said by John <coughs> in verse 6, This figure of speech spake Jesus unto them, but, all right, now listen, this figure of speech, spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Parables. Then, in the Gospels, what comes after that? When he gives them a parable, and it says they understood not what he said, then what comes after that? The explanation. They ask him and say, well, we don't know what's going on. Will you explain? And he always rebukes them. Are ye of so little understanding? You don't know what I'm talking about. And it does, we don't read all that here, but sure, the next thing, when we're told in verse 6 that they didn't understand these things, then the very next thing is going to be the interpretation. Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. Amen. The, just six verses later, from where they start, he tells us what the door is. Now, wasn't that hard to find out, well, I wonder what the door is. It's the human body. So what do they do with that is the next question. The first door is natural body and therefore natural birth. This door, since Jesus says, I'm this door, is spiritual rebirth. And you can only be successful in the kingdom if you're born physically and then born again. They would tell us for the second time, born again spiritually. And here's where Jesus tells us that I'm the door of the sheep. Now, you're saying, well, how can you refute that? Well, the passage refutes it because where in the world do you get the right and the justification for just inserting in verse 1 that the door is the body and the sheepfold is the world? You have to have, you see... They are, this is a typically charismatic interpretation of a biblical passage. They have no justification for it, but it sounds good, so they do it. Where is, you see, you can't just tell me what the door means, especially not when the same chapter tells me what the door is, and then you tell me it means something else. 
Now, you can tell me it means something else as long as you can give me a verse that says the door is the human body. Just give me that verse, and then we can fit that with John 10, 1, and that'll be just fine. Of course, you've still got a problem with verse 7 according to this chapter. But if we didn't have verse 7, still we have to ask the question, where do you get your justification for just telling us what the door is? Since he doesn't tell us in verse 1. Now, he goes on to tell us. He didn't leave us in the dark on what the door is. But they tell us the door is the human body. The sheepfold is the world. But guess what? If anything, the world would be the goat fold and not the sheep fold because sheep are always his people and his disciples. And if you're going to make whatever this is, sheep fold, goat, if you're going to make this the whole world, then you're including saved people and lost people as well. How could you call that the sheepfold? Throughout the Old and the New Testament, we see God as shepherd and his people, not the world. They don't know their Bibles. Throughout both Testaments, we see God as shepherd and his people as the sheep of his pasture. And therefore, the sheepfold and not the world. And he tells us, you know how he found this out? By revelation. I've told you before, they get these from demons. He tells in the book here, he said, I've read that passage many times. And I, he said, I finally stopped and asked the Lord, what is the door? And I have to ask him, why did you ask when he tells you in verse 7? <laughs> if you ask when he's already told you, then you're telling him you're not satisfied with his answer. And since he can't deny himself, he's not going to give you another answer. But he'll give you a 1 Kings 22 lying spirit that'll come down and will give you that other answer you're looking for. 1 Kings 22. It happened then. It's happening untold multitude of times today in the studies or generally it's on the airplanes, they never study, it's always on the way to a meeting of charismatic leaders. Not in their studies, but on their airplanes. They get these revelations. You know, he's read this. You know, I've never had a teaching on what this is, but I just kind of knew what it was. The door is Jesus. He calls himself the door in Scripture. The sheepfold, that's me. I'm part of the sheepfold. He that cometh some other way besides through Jesus, besides through his message and his word, the same as the thief and the robber. Now, you might not know who he's talking about, the thief and the robber, but remember, John 10 is connected to John 9. The thief and the robber he's talking about is not Satan. It's the scribes, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees. Those deceivers, those charismatic deceivers today who are climbing up some other way besides going through Jesus Christ. They're telling us to go through the human body to get into the sheepfold. And the Bible says go through the sun to get into the sheepfold. So they don't know that, that they, although they would like to call God the thief and the robber, they are the thieves and robbers, according to this verse. Remember the whole chapter before this, all of John 9 is about the man born blind who was excommunicated by the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees from the synagogue because he testified a positive, bold testimony for Jesus. They didn't like that. And they even asked his parents, and his parents were afraid. They knew that the Pharisees had said, we'll put out of the synagogue whoever confesses him. So they said, well, he's age, ask him. They said, we already asked him. We want to know, well, he's of age, ask him. In other words, they were looking for a back door, an easy way out. And he's willing to confess. Verse 38, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. But you see, he's already been put out now because of his confession that he's made. And so the thief and the robber, in other words, of John 10 and verse 1, are the religious leaders of Jesus' day. And, of course, they are the same religious leaders of our day. So verse 7 clinches the fact that the door couldn't possibly refer to a human body, but it refers to Jesus when he says, I am the door of the sheep, and it's through me that you gain entrance into the sheepfold. But because that verse is there, you know, that <clears throat> posed a problem to them, so they explained that as being spiritual birth. Now, remember, I'll just make a comment in passing, because sometimes it's confusing unless you understand how to interpret the allegories and the parables of the Gospels. 
Notice here in this passage that Jesus is called the door, verse 7. Uh, but he that entereth by the door, verse 2, is the shepherd. And who's the shepherd? Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. Well, now, how can you be the shepherd and walk through yourself because you're the door at the same time? Well, that's where you got to know how to interpret the parables. They don't always make sense, just like sometimes a dream or a vision doesn't always make sense in all of the particulars that it has because you see yourself doing strange and weird things. Well, the parables are the same way because back in John chapter 6, Jesus says in verse 35, I am the bread of life, but then in verse 51, he says, I'm the one who's going to give you the bread of life. So you see there he's made himself the giver and the gift. And over here in John chapter 10, he's made himself the shepherd and the door by which the shepherd enters. But he's trying to get across two different points here. One is that he's the door into eternal life, but then you've got to have someone to lead the sheep. So after you use the analogy of the door, you drop that and you go on to the shepherd analogy. And now he says, now I'm not the door now. I'm the shepherd. I was the door to gain entrance into eternal life, and now I'm the shepherd to lead you in pasture uh, while you are awaiting the manifestation of the full benefits of eternal life. So that's the way a lot of the parables are. That's the way a lot of Jesus' teaching is. He'll put himself as two different things at the same time, especially in John's Gospel. So you can just remember that. Now, I find a couple of interesting thoughts about this <clears throat> whole theory that evidently they've, they've not really thought of. And one of them concerns Satan himself. They tell us that Satan, I just gave it to you and when I was giving you a little description of, of uh, what the whole belief was about and according to what I read out of their writings and from their tapes, that Satan is the illegitimate stepfather of Adam, that Satan illegally gained control of this world. Now, the problem with that is he had two bodies to work through, Adam and Eve. Therefore, he gained control, they would say, of this world completely legally. He didn't work through some other way. Who does he always try to work through? People, bodies. He wants to deceive people. He wants to gain entrance in bodies. Now, how can you call that illegal entrance when really that's legal entrance according to your own theory? And then call God's entrance illegal whenever he tries to do something apart from the human body. In other words, you've got uh, a double standard here. You say that it's illegal for God to work in any other way except the body, the human body, the vehicle of earthly authority. But it is legal for Satan to work any other way except through man's body. You see, God is illegal on one hand and Satan is legal on the other. Satan had two bodies, Adam and Eve, to work through, then why do you tell us that he gained entrance illegally into the earth and he is illegally operating here because he's operating through human bodies just like, according to your theory, God is. So they're inconsistent in their own theory. And then a second thing concerns the incarnation. Like I said earlier, they make a big thing about this incarnation. They give us the reference over there in Hebrew 10 that... God made this special body for Jesus. Jesus had to have a body. He had to be conceived by the, as the seed of the woman. He had to be conceived in the virgin's womb. He had to have a body before he could legally gain entrance into this world. And they put the whole emphasis upon Jesus' body. Then why is it when we get to the subject of redemption, you drop the body and start talking about the spirit? Because the same ones teach the JDS heresy. They've put so much emphasis on the body, special body of Jesus, holy body of Jesus. We're told in 1 Peter 2.24, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. And they make a big deal about the body. They don't like that verse because it's anti-spiritual death theory of theirs. But they put this big emphasis on the body Yet when it comes to redemption, all of a sudden they stop talking about Jesus' body physically and start telling us, now he redeemed us spiritually by his spirit dying in hell. Well, that's illegal then. 
That's illegal. You have to work through a body in order for it to be legal. And it's illegal to have him dying spiritually then. Well, look over in the book of Isaiah. I want to close with two passages. Isaiah 63. They say the same thing, but we'll look at both of them. Isaiah 63, verses 5 and 6. <coughs> well, we won't look at that one. I'll give it to you because it says the same thing. Isaiah 63, 5 and 6, and then just a couple of chapters earlier. Chapter 59. This says it a little bit better as far as refuting this theory. Isaiah 59, beginning with verse 16. All right, now, watch and see. All charismatic heretics, watch and see. And he saw that there was no man. So that really ruined his idea of doing anything. He saw that there was no body. There was no man, and he wondered that there was no intercessor. They tell us the only thing, only way anything's going to be done today is by intercession. Everyone has to intercede because God uses bodies. He wondered, therefore his arm brought salvation unto him, and his righteousness it sustained him. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate and an helmet of salvation upon his head, and he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. According to their deeds, accordingly he will repay fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies. To the islands he will repay recompense. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, then the spirit of the Lord, not the body, I mean the spirit and the body are just opposite from one another. Then the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. Amen. Now, the whole emphasis of the passage, especially beginning in verse 16, is God saying, I looked for a man and an intercessor, and I couldn't find one. And did it bother me? He said, no, I just rolled up my sleeves and did the job myself. And they don't like that at all. Oh, he can't do that. He's got to work through a body. He said, I looked for a body. He said, I, I wondered that there was no intercessor. But does man's lack of concern over the plans of God stop God's plans from being fulfilled? God forbid. Do some people's unbelief make the faith of God or the promises of God without effect? God forbid. God is not dependent on people. He most definitely does not need a human body to work through. He has angels to do whatever needs to be done. And it's not like they aren't doing things, and it's not like there's a possibility that they could be doing things, because Jesus said, if I wanted to, I could pray to my Father, and he presently would send me 12 legions of angels. He, he told his disciples, they that take the sword will perish with the sword. I don't need any man to defend me. If I wanted any defense, I could pray for some spirits. That's what angels are. They're ministering spirits. I could pray for some spirits, and they would come down here illegally and whip the devil illegally, and, of course, he'd take God to court over the whole matter because it was illegal and get an injunction against the kingdom of God. I say, that's about what could happen. Jesus didn't say, I, I need you, or I need a Roman army. He said, I need some legions. He said, but I could call for 12 legions of angels. And they'd come and fight my battles for me. No bodies there to work through because they're just spirits coming down. And from the very beginning, before there was such thing as a body, there was God. And he didn't owe his existence to man, but man owes his existence to God. There are a lot of false teachings and misconceptions about people and their willingness or their lack thereof to further the kingdom of God. The denominations teach the same thing. They've got to have all of their human plans and programs to help build the kingdom of God. They don't believe that God can just do things by his spirit. 
and charismatics who ought to believe things about the Spirit of God since they're claiming to have the Spirit and speak by the Spirit, at least when they're doing it, doing it in tongues, they are about in the same boat by believing that we've got to have all of our own plans and programs. And um, there's one charismatic deceiver who is trying to get the whole island of Cuba converted by sending balloons over with slips of John 3.16 in it. <laughs> and this, he says this is an all-out launching attack on communism. We're going to take the island of Cuba. Sending helium-filled balloons, and they do it in the dead of night, and they're so proud of themselves like a Gestapo spy or something, <laughs> slipping out there with a ship and sending all these balloons up during the middle of the night, and they're going to fall, and people are going to read it and say this is a good day to get saved because a balloon fell out of the sky. People don't get saved because balloons fall out of the sky. People get saved when God elects them and calls them unto salvation. Yeah. Yes, certainly we know he could use a balloon or a slip of paper, but that's the whole mentality of the denominational charismatic world that that's the only way that things can get done yeah. is by having helium balloons flown over your island. Can you believe it? And the same, the same fella was, this was at an earlier time, the same fella was filling bottles up with slips of Gospels and throwing them out in the ocean. <laughs> I, bet, I bet he's really successful. Of the millions of square miles that bottle is going to float before it ends up in some aborigine hut in Australia. And he can't even read English anyway. <laughs> and how are you going to know what language to print it in? You don't know where that bottle is going. They just, and he took a whole boatload of bottles out with, <laughs> with the Roman road in there and throw them, <laughs> throw them overboard and just bless them. And, you know, they believe that they're anointed. They pray over them and sweat over them to make them good and anointed and throw them out there. And where it goes, nobody knows. And nobody cares. I don't care where those bottles are going. That's not going to get anybody converting. You don't find Paul slipping some bottles in the Mediterranean during the shipwreck there. He says, I get people converted, Romans 15, by mighty signs and wonders through the ministry of an apostle. <laughs> people don't have any power today because they are resisting the work and the ministry and the message of the Holy Spirit. And it is a message that is all God and no man, and man doesn't like that. But you don't find Paul or Luke or his companions slipping some little balloons out. I'm sure they had some type of earthen pottery jug there. They could have capped it up and slipped an epistle in there and <laughs> hoped it found its way to Rome or something. He says as much as in me is I'm ready to preach the gospel to you at Rome. Not I'm going to send by means of a genie in a bottle the message of salvation to you. Charismatics are in the same bottle as most denominational people, thinking that it's going to be by our own sweat and our own effort that we're going to get the kingdom of God further. And they don't believe, evidently, Isaiah 59, 19, when the enemy shall come in like a flood, then the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. The is moving all across this wicked land.
for a 